Hi, everybody. Um, I wanted to uh, go over a basic primer on uh, some graphic design principles that I think will be really, really helpful and useful uh, to many of you as you are building out your presentations. Um, I should start off by saying that you could say the best things in the world. You could uh, be as honest and genuine and sincere in what you're saying, what you're writing. And, um, you know, I often blow this out to an extreme with, uh, you know, your, your ad copy, your storytelling could end world peace or start world peace or end, end world hunger. And, um, seriously, I'm not a super villain and, uh, cure all kinds of cancers. Um, but that's only if, what you are saying is presented in an aesthetically engaging enough wrapper to um, pull people in, to pique their curiosity, to uh, get them to actually care. All right. And so what you're saying is just as important as how you're saying it. And in looking through the the presentations thus far, a lot of you are are doing a lot of good work. I mean, this is outside of the context of just the content. So I'm just referring to the visuals and the design. Many of you are doing really good work in this area. Some of you are struggling a little bit, um, but everyone in the class needs uh, more uh, information, more perspective on the design process on um, the principles of design. So um, I'm gonna start off with uh, the four uh, principles that some of you may already be familiar with. And those are called the crap principles, okay? Um, they are not called this uh, because they are crap. Um, this stands for contrast, repetition, alignment, proximity. OK, and so when you are designing your work, please always keep in mind crap, contrast, repetition, alignment and proximity. What does this mean? What does this look like? So let's start with contrast. OK, so contrast is mostly going to be related to uh, color. However, it isn't exclusively applied to color all right contrast is all about making elements different from one another to create understanding all right so for example we've got uh this square and then we've got a circle by virtue of their design they are different they contrast okay if i change the color they contrast further if I change the scale, they contrast even further. If I change the positioning or proximity of the elements between each other, then they contrast even further, okay? Contrast is really, really important. It helps create understanding. It helps create eye movement and flow. So for example, you may see this group of images. Um, as disparate, separate objects, okay? They're distance from one another. Each is in a different scale. Um, each will be in a different color. They all contrast against each other. But there is a very particular type of movement happening here with uh, these shapes. They are moving downward, okay? Um, one of the reasons why they are moving this way, why they're moving downward is because of their placement, okay? Um, but also the proximity of the shapes relative to each other creates eye movement. It creates this downward pointing eye movement. Additionally, the square is the largest thing on the artboard. And so we are going to create hierarchy through scale, positioning, color. So you may look at this square here and say, this is the beginning of the journey. And then that journey moves downward because even though these are different objects, the 
hierarchy of scale creates actual hierarchy with with the shapes it tells your brain like this is the proper order in which these shapes flow okay so let's uh take this uh in a different way so let's move these now we've reversed the order just a little bit and now you may be looking at this and saying well the square is still the beginning of the order and it moves up okay that would i think in most senses be true but some of you may be looking at the blue circle here and i'll get to why that's important in a moment okay so generally speaking the first thing that you are going to look at that you're going to pay attention to is always going to be the biggest and the brightest element on your artboard okay by virtue of its scale by virtue of its color it is going to create what is called dominance visual dominance it is visually overwhelming to the other elements on the page okay and so you're going to look at this first now if i scale this down to a really tiny degree you're going to look at this so deference essentially falls to the largest image uh, or the brightest color so let's say for example let's get rid of these two and i'm going to pull this circle and i'm just going to make this a different color make it brighter and they're of equal size they're the exact same shape they're in close proximity to one another but the yellow circle is dominant okay so where there is equivalency in scale then the brightest color is going to call the most attention to itself okay so this here is an example of of dominance through scale positioning and color contrast just using basic shapes but we use this principle to create understanding here's an example of what that may look like so if for example you're working on your powerpoint And let's pull some bacon ipsum. If you are not familiar with bacon ipsum, it is basically a meteor lorem ipsum generator. So we can pull some, some uh, Greeking, some Latin copy here. All right, I'm gonna drop that in. Let's make this 12 point, left align. And now you can see that there is hierarchy. There is order to these elements, okay? Notice that these two elements follow a very specific linear format, okay? And this is, this is alignment, okay? So we want these two elements to be aligned because they are associated with one another. They are separate, but they are connected. And so this creates a grouping. This creates uh, a sense of organization um, and purpose. So let's hold on to that thought because I want to move around and talk about something else very briefly that is also connected. And I want you to be thinking about, as I'm making this, I want you to be thinking about how you read. How were you taught to read? What were your struggles with that? Um, what did you learn how to read on? Children's books, pictures book, picture books, novels, magazines. Maybe it was, uh, maybe you're like me and you learned to read from comic books, um, which makes for an interesting experience later in life um you'll notice here that i have put yellow squares in the four quadrants of this artboard okay one thing that i want you to be thinking about again in how you read or how we're taught to read is that we are taught to read from top to bottom left to right Okay, so if we do that again, top to bottom, left to right, we actually start in the top left-hand corner, 
move to the right, move down to the bottom left-hand corner, move to the bottom right. Now, if we're in Japan, this is uh, essentially opposite. Um, be that as it may, what you're looking at is called a Z pattern. This is our natural starting point and ending point. This is where we are going to, um, this is essentially where we start reading and capture all of the content trapped within the footer and uh, the footer and the header. Right. So this is called a Z pattern. This is the most common form of eye movement. This is essentially how we're trained to read. Now, there is another uh, eye movement, and it's particularly more uh, prevalent in web design called the F pattern. And pardon my poor drawing skills here. I'm using a mouse. Um, the F pattern. And what the F pattern suggests is you start here. You move all the way to the right, then you move back, you move down to the right, back to the left, et cetera, okay? It's not the most intuitive or logical, but um, it does work. But we mostly work in the Z pattern. Now, how do you make a Z pattern work in a 16 by nine landscape PowerPoint presentation? I'll get into that momentarily. Essentially, the principles are the same. But nevertheless, let's come back to what's going on here. So we have our four quadrants. And we've got this, you may see this uh, pink frame show up. What this is, is called the live area. The live area is the guaranteed place where all of your design elements will be seen. Now we're in Canva, it's going to save the whole artboard as an image, all right? And I don't wanna get into the specifics of the software. Be that as it may, this is the live area. This is where the margins, top, bottom, left and right, excuse me, are equal. Having equal margins creates a nice, comfortable framing for your content. But I don't want you to feel trapped by that frame. You should um, absolutely feel free to explore it, but obviously something like as it's positioned now is not going to work, okay? So you've got that pink frame and essentially that's your equal margins. And now we need to draw something else. And I'm gonna throw in a triangle and I'm going to invert that triangle like so, all right? We read from top to bottom, left to right, which means all of the most important information and the things that we are trying to design and the communications that we are trying to convey need to be at the top of the layout. Okay, so we read top to bottom, left to right, most important information at the top, least important information at the bottom. Think of all of the things that you read, all of the things that um, you're making, your, your slides, your reports, anything. The end is always, you know, at the bottom, essentially. And in some cases, the ending uh, to your story is the most important part. In some cases, it's not. Without getting into the weeds on a narrative structure, we're talking about visual communications. So the most important information at the top, least important information at the bottom. Our brains don't like to work, okay? But they love to learn. And um, oftentimes I have students asking me, well, what's the difference? Because learning is working and working is learning. Yes, that's true. Um, but I would say that the difference between the two is all in intent and attitude. Okay. So our brains love to learn, but they don't like to work. And essentially what this means is that if you need someone to learn something, you need to create an engaging entry point to what they need to learn so that they are interested in learning it. And then once they invest their mind, their curiosity into the thing you want them to learn, you need to make that experience just as pleasant and accessible as the entry point so that they continue to move through the experience that you've designed for them. Okay. Um, 
This is called readability and legibility. Readability is the desire to read something. I have a choice in what I read. Legibility is the functional ability to actually read something once I invest in um, what has piqued my curiosity. Okay, so if you follow these principles, you are going to create a design that is both readable and legible. Okay, so I'm going to delete this text and we're going to take this one step further. So I often uh, make this template and uh, use it as sort of a beginner's approach to graphic design. Because in some cases, it's easier to break apart an artboard into quarters or into this sort of diagram diagrammatic um, experience so that you, non-designers, can approach design in a very partitioned way, okay? And so what you're looking at now is essentially this diagram, but with four quadrants. And these four quadrants represent essentially different parts of the Z pattern. So let's draw that Z again. And you'll note that um, the Z pattern breaks through each of the quadrants. Um, but right here in the center is quite possibly the most important. So let's call attention to that, okay? So now you have your quadrants within, your quadrants within quadrants, okay? So let's reduce the opacity on that and just ghost it down a little bit. And now you can see just exactly where the eye is moving across the layout. Now, you may be thinking, wow, this is a really great way to make boring homogenous design work. Yes, it is a great way to do that. However, the onus is on you to understand the functional aspects of a layout of eye movement and then willingly break those rules. Graphic design is more of an art than a science, but it still has science behind it. This is all psychology. This is actually not even psychology. It's mathematics, okay? Um, and yeah, so if you have an understanding of the relationships between all of these spaces, eye movement, et cetera, then you are going to make for, uh, uh, you're going to make a better design because you know enough of the rules to break them. And that is what creates intrigue. Okay, so we've got we've got our essential layout here. Um, I'm going to take this one step further, and I'm going to apply a different color to create some differentiation, some contrast, if you will. So I know what you're saying, like thinking this is looking pretty messy. How am I supposed to make any sense of this? I completely get that. And these uh, blue lines relative to one another are nowhere near equal. All right. But for the purposes of this demo, they don't really need to be. Okay. So let's do this one more time. Oh. Let's rotate this. Give it a different color. And now what we're building is a grid. Designers, good designers, design by the grid and then willingly break it. 
Okay. If you look at uh, the 1940s Swiss style of graph design from the Basel and Zurich schools, you'll see how they both uh, break the grid and uh, conform to it. And it creates for a really dynamic uh, minimalist uh, presentation. All right. So now you're seeing a multi-column, multi-row grid. And visually, this is overwhelming. All right. I have no doubt about that, that you're like looking at this and thinking like, what in the hell is he talking about? OK, so this is useful because it helps us with crap, contrast, repetition, alignment, placement. All right. So I'm going to. Um, add in one element. To ghost out our diagram essentially and so make it a little less noisy okay and we're going to design on top of this so i'm going to grab a heading and again i can see the z pattern i know exactly what i want to say maybe how i want to say it but i don't quite know the design of it so i'm going to start off by putting my heading in the center, okay? And this is gonna say, stories make us human. And as you're looking at that, you know, it feels pretty basic. It's vertically centered, it's horizontally centered, it's in the direct center of the page. It cuts through uh, the Z patterns, so a human is forced to look at it. It is just there. OK, um, but it's not engaging. It's not interesting. It's just there. So I'm going to use some creative liberty. And introduce some hard returns. Now, when we look at that, this has a completely different feel to it, where it was on one line. It was it was linear. It was concise and to the point. Stories make us human. But when you look at it now, you may be thinking, well, it takes on a different connotation, an entirely different tone. Stories make us human. Now there's visual pacing, right? Um, there's visual pacing happening. There is potentially rhythm. Maybe it's becoming musical, right? Stories make us human. Let's take this one step further. And I'm gonna delete the word human and stories make us. And I'm going to adjust the font and we'll use a uh, Rubik regular. And I'm just gonna put human down there again. And yes, I'm very aware that this is center aligned. I don't hate center alignment as much as you think, but nevertheless, let's read it again. Stories make us human. All right. So now there's a different intonation between the regular font and then the bold font. All right. Stories make us human. And it's up to us to figure out just exactly how to wrap that rhythm, that tone, that emotional content into other elements. Okay. So I'm going to push this down here for the time being. And I want to sort of switch topics briefly. And I want to talk about um, repetition. Okay. So we've got, actually just going to delete this. No, I won't delete it. I will hide it behind the white. There we go. Okay. It'll come back. We'll come back to that. All right. So I have the square. And it is one square. It is a system unto itself. I'm going to scale that down and I'm going to clone it. Now I have a group of squares. I'm going to select both of those and I have more squares. Okay. I'm going to select those. I'm going to make even more, even more. 
And if you're watching this and you have some level of OCD, <laughs> I apologize. Um, but if you look closely, really focus on the largest square, which is a square that is made up out of all of these individual squares. And when you look at the intersections in white, this is called negative space, you should be seeing these phantom gray dots. And they may feel animated or kinetic, um, like they're in motion, like they fade in, they fade out. That's all entirely relative to where your eye is moving on the artboard at any time. Okay, this is creating an optical illusion. And you've probably seen this before. Okay, but what you're looking at here is a full blown example of repetition, simply put. Okay, this is uh, a very symmetrical, kind of boring, uh, but strongly foundationed design. All right. What you're experiencing is a principle called the, the Gestalt theory. And what that is about, if you're not familiar, is that it defines it as the whole is the sum of its parts. So here's the whole shape. Okay. And it is composed of all of these squares. Notice that those dots go away. Right. And one of the reasons is, is because of the color contrast. So when that goes away, the stronger contrast um, represents itself and creates that optical effect. All right. But you can make shapes out of smaller shapes. The whole is the sum of its parts. OK. And you can uh, repeat these elements to create what is called visual unity. All right. Now, um, again, it's symmetrical, it's grid based, it's logical, it's linear. For my OCD folks, I apologize. But if this bothers you, there's a reason for that. Think about why this would bother you. Well, first off, uh, our brains uh, like to complete things all right this is called a sense of completion and essentially what our brain is screaming right now is fix the shape fix the shape fix the shape put it back put it back put it back this is actually creating anxiety all right just through moving pixels around on a screen you, you may be feeling anxiety i'll put it back now you may be feeling better all right but if there's one thing that you've learned from this is that by removing one element you've degraded that unity and you've created what is called expressiveness, all right? You're expressing yourself through a creative choice, all right? So our brains like that sense of completion. Our brain likes the, the logical order and structure of this grid, okay? Um, it makes sense. We're in our happy place. We're comfortable. And then anxiety city, okay? Well, what if instead of moving it, I create it as a different color, okay? Now you have unity, but within that unity, you have a focal point or what is called an anomaly, all right? This is an anomalous shape because it is one color by itself and it's not the other colors, okay? So if we take that one step further, it's even more of an anomaly. It's even more of a focal point, not just because we removed it from this unified shape, um, but because of its color and its proximity relative to the shape, we are calling attention to itself, all right? Creating attention is as simple as that. All right, so that's essentially Gestalt theory. Now, all of these are in alignment, okay? And this is when you place elements deliberately and rationally to improve clarity. All right, but in aligning objects, there's something I want you to consider. And that is the emotional equivalent or the emotional interpretation of negative space between elements. Again, negative space is the space that you are not using, okay? Um, negative space is the white. It's the space that you're not using. So what is the space called that you are using? That is called positive space. And positive space 
essentially appears in the foreground. So when I'm making comments on like foreground, background, contrast, this is essentially what I'm talking about. The artboard here is white because it has, it's neutral. So most colors are going to contrast well against it. Most, but not all. Okay. Um, so if I were to take this purple and decrease, uh, decrease that color a little bit, at maybe add a little more white, you'll see that the contrast isn't as strong. Okay. There's contrast. It's not as strong. It's subtle, but it works. But you'll notice that that red square, it, it, it sticks out, but it doesn't stick out in a good way. Like it feels jarring to some of you. It may feel like it's moving. Okay. This is called a, a vibrating color. And it's when a, a color feels like it is vibrating on the page or whatever in whatever grouping it's in because of the poor contrast behind it. So let's remove it. Okay, good contrast. Put it back, bad contrast. Yes, it still sticks out. Um, it still calls attention to itself, but the contrast isn't as strong. So let's try blue, okay? If it wasn't vibrating before, it may be now because red and blue do not contrast well against each other. Okay. So let's make uh, a second page real quick. I'm going to pull up a, uh, a graphic that um, I think is relevant to this color contrast conversation. And I'll make this image available to you all. But what you're looking at is a foreground, background, contrast, grading scale. Okay. So red against red, you can't see it. Red against orange, that's poor. Red against yellow, that's good. Red against green creates a vibrating color. Red at blue, vibrating color. Red violet, vibrating color. Okay. Color contrast is something that you experience daily and you know when it works and you know when it doesn't, but you may not be able to uh, define it or explain it or quantify it, okay? This is an excellent tool in understanding what colors are going to work or not, all right? So let's move back up here and let's talk more about alignment. So these are all in alignment, a grid-based order, makes sense. It's great. But I'm going to get rid of some of these. And how would you describe this grouping of shapes? What words would you use? Okay, now they're equal. Um, you may be thinking like structured, ordered, linear, logical, okay, um, strong, um, any number of different adjectives that you can use, right? Well, what about now? How would you describe that? What is the emotional connection to that? And this is, rhetor this is rhetorical. What about this one? You can actually see some eye movement occurring here. This would be symmetrical. Our brains like this because now, instead of being orderly as a part of a group, it's starting to create a pattern, which is also ordered. Ordered. It's it's chaos ordered. Okay, but what if I move it here, off centered? Now it's a little bit different. Okay, you can create a lot of communication just through the positioning of shapes. Okay, um, more than more than you know. So you can also align in any direction. Create order there. 
So I would encourage you to experiment with contrast, repetition, alignment, placement to create uh, different interpretations, okay, uh, of design, different expressions of design. So let's go back to here. And uh, we're making an ad, essentially. And this is going to be an ad for the Pennsylvania Humanities, um, an organization, statewide organization in Pennsylvania I sit on the board of. And our whole purpose is to essentially use storytelling as a means of cultural cultivation, um, particularly in areas that are very underserved. So for example, um, I grew up in uh, Northwestern Pennsylvania in a small river town in uh, Warren County. Um, uh, essentially, I grew up in the forest with bears in my backyard along the river, um, quite idyllic in most senses, except for the culture, right? Um, contrary to what you may believe of me now, uh, when I was a kid and uh, a teenager, um, maybe like many of us, I didn't know anything. Um, and I was really fairly ignorant on a lot of things. Um not uh not anything hostile or or awful just like i was just unaware of the world um because my world was where i grew up and you know you only know what you know um you're you're not exactly evolved enough to know what you don't know and what you need to know okay so the pa humanities their whole goal is to open up those lines of storytelling and communication and um have a positive impact on culture, but uh, we need to make an ad for them to create awareness. And their tagline is stories make us human. So I'm just gonna start with the tagline in the center. I would I'd recommend that many of you just start in the center, follow this template, start in the center, and then experiment from there. When you feel like you've landed on a good idea, make a duplicate of it, clone it, always be cloning, you know, have 50 different iterations of one design if you have to. Don't delete things unnecessarily, because uh, it's when you do that you might be deleting good ideas that you could use later on, okay? So I'm going to pull their logo right here, and, you know, I can make it... Uh, in a comparable size to the tagline. And again, I know this looks visually busy, but now the tagline and the logo are competing with each other. There is no sense of structure, order, or hierarchy. But this is using uh, what is essentially a two column sort of blocked design. And, you know, again, sense of completion, our brains like completion. So both of these elements essentially will fit inside of a box. Okay. And that keeps things really nice and orderly and contained, but I don't want these two elements being right next to each other. Um, I want people to ruminate and think about what this tagline is saying um, before they make the association with the tagline and the story with the organization. So think about any ads that you've seen. We read from top to bottom, left to right. Oftentimes, any ads that you see, be they printed or digital, the logo is always at the bottom left-hand corner, okay? Some of you may have a prefer uh, an unintentional preference to put the logo in the absolute bottom right-hand corner, and this actually degrades its legibility and its uh, readability because... Uh, and also you're risking cutting it off. So I always recommend having the logo be at least an inch and a half in diameter and positioned margins, uh, having margins that are equal on the bottom and the right. And so it feels like it's nested well uh, in the bottom right hand corner. Okay, you can maybe even push it down just a little bit. All right, so there's our logo. Stories make us human right in the center. All right, so I'm going to get another shape and let's get rid of, uh, let's ghost out the, the background here.
Okay, so now we can still see our underlying structure, um, our guide as it were, and uh, we can still continue to design. Now I need like a good image. Think about storytelling and how you learned how to read, right? Bringing it back full circle. Who taught you how to read? How did you learn how to read? Um, what was that process like? Um, it was probably done through storytelling, right? Children's books, comic books, picture books, novels. It's all stories. We learn, we as humans learn about our culture, our lives through stories. And so um, what better way to start? So let's say uh, I'm just going to type in storytelling. And I'm going to look for a photo and let's see what we can find. All right, we got, you know, uh, adults here having a conversation. We've got a family reading a book. That's really sentimental. Let's let's pull this image. Okay, so here's my image. Obviously, the black text does not have a strong contrast against a an image with no joke millions of colors. Um, so let's investigate this image a little bit further. Okay, so um, this is a nice shot. the The father in the background seems a bit distanced from the uh, the, the mother and child. So um, maybe this is not the photo that we want. Maybe we'll come back to it. Let's look at this one here. Okay. So there he is. And it, again, it's still strange, um, but this is a much better photo for my purposes. I don't need, honestly, the husband to be a part of my ad. So I'm going to take this image and I'm going to position it at the absolute top and pull it all the way to the bottom. Now, this is essentially what is called a full image ad, and not all ads are going to have full images, okay? But this is a nice one. It works out really well, but um, let's affect the uh, layering here so we can get a sense of what we're looking at. All right, so I see the logo. It's got poor contrast because of the gray. Even the multicolored 50, which is the 50th anniversary, isn't showing up very well. And so I'm going to move this tagline up. We'll ignore the logo for now. And okay, so this is kind of interesting. We've got stories make us human and we've got all of this negative space in the background. And, um, you know, the, the black text is legible. It's not entirely readable. Let's make this white. And that makes uh, a pretty stark improvement on the design, but it feels a little weird. Like we've got these elements that aren't, it just doesn't feel fully composed. So let's scale this back and, and take a look at, at the diagram. So we start up here and when the end user, your viewer starts here, they actually have to start their journey on the right hand side. So there's some latency, there's some delay um, from the, the left hand side. So maybe this is either not the best photo or the best cropping for this photo. We may have some, some options here. But as we move down, we see her face and I'll address faces in a moment. And we move down to the, to the left hand corner bottom left-hand corner, see the edge of the book, finish with the logo. So there is a logical flow here, even though there's some delay. Um, the peripheral vision permits for the logo to be seen here. But does the logo really feel, I'm sorry, not the logo, the tagline, does the tagline really feel connected to these two people? So one thing I want you to think about is uh, why we look at faces. Seriously, why as humans, why do we have faces? What's the purpose? Why do animals have faces? Um, well, obviously we use our faces functionally for seeing, smelling, hearing, uh, talking, communicating. Um, they serve a functional purpose. But what about smiling? What's the functional purpose behind smiling? Um, I think if you were a caveman, um, smiling um 
wouldn't necessarily have a defined purpose. It would just be a reaction, be it positive or negative. But I've heard people say that smiling is um, actually an offensive tactic. It it creates uh, a sense of of danger. So if you're thinking back to your caveman hunter gatherer days, you know, smiling, gritting your teeth is a threat. All right. And so um, I also want you to think about the eyes. So for example, um, when I was an undergraduate student, I would uh, take more of my professor's time than he was probably comfortable giving me, but he did it anyway. And, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, but I would always ask him about design and other things. And uh, we would just talk about everything. And um, one of the things that I would notice is anytime I'm talking to him, if I move my eyes to the left or to the right, um, he would also look in the same direction that I'm looking, okay? And that is actually a, a defense mechanism. So we look at faces, uh, obviously, to, to recognize them, but we are also looking at visual cues, micro expressions. And, you know, so anytime I moved my eyes to the left, he would look to the left. Anytime I moved to the right, he would look to the right. And uh, I used them as, an, uh, as sort of a... Um, I use this interaction as, as research and I just kept doing it. And he's like, what the hell's wrong with you? Why are you doing this? I'm like, I'm trying to understand why every time I look left, you look left. And, and he explained to me that, um, you know, we look at faces um, as also a, uh, as a, a, a measure for danger. So if you look to the left, I'm going to look to the left because my lizard brain, okay, um, is my subconscious amygdala lizard brain is saying, Hey, um, there's danger, fight or flight, fight or flight, fight or flight is in everything. Okay. And so when we look at stories that feature people, especially static stories like ads, we're looking for the faces. We're looking for the connection, the relatability. Um, we're looking to see if there's danger or peace. Um, do I, do I fight or do I flight or do I, you know, uh, drop my guard essentially. Um, but we're also looking at faces to create that relatability. I want to see myself in the people that are being featured in the ad. So, you know, my daughter's eight, I remember reading to her, um, when she was younger, what I'm seeing in this image is absolutely a feeling an emotional uh, it, it resonates emotionally. I experienced this. I felt this. And that is a positive, happy, nostalgic memory. Okay. So looking at these two and this tagline, it makes sense. There is a uh, triangular uh, composition to this. relationship okay um looking at this triangle you can make the argument that like oh they're it's like they're kind of looking at the tagline so but they're not it's more parallel to the woman's face than it is below it so what if we push this down to here let's increase that contrast the opacity rather. And now it's even more triangular, but the triangular composition, the orientation is a little bit different. Now the woman is looking at the tagline essentially, and the tagline is more closely connected to the subjects. And this is proximity in principle, in practice, right? So this makes sense, but What's also really cool about this is that it is near the vertical and horizontal centered. So this is a top, this is actually a bottom heavy design. So if I move this logo over to be in alignment, vertical alignment with the tagline, now what you're looking at is a relatively basic composition
that is essentially two columns. And there's hierarchy there. So you can see she commands the most attention. And then you look at her face as you move down through the Z pattern. You look directly at the tagline. And then you look at the logo. All right. But the kid is kind of, you know, uh, I wouldn't say uh, forgotten, but certainly not a primary feature, definitely a secondary feature. Right. So that could just be the ad. Or we could put this logo here. Let's edit the image and um, let's make it, I don't know, more white. Uh, sorry, computer is being a little slow. There we go. All right. Adjust. Decrease the temperature. I'm cheating here. Uh, but I think you get the idea. Okay. So now it makes sense. It works. These are like two, two column layout looks great. That's one in the bank. That's one idea. Let's duplicate that and let's modify it because the, the cropping to me isn't like fully settled. Let's move this guy back. He's just so creepy. I don't like it. Let's keep them back in the design, but let's flip it. Now, this is even more dynamic. It's stronger because we're starting in the top left-hand corner and we're scanning and we cut through down to the Z pattern where all of the content is in the bottom left-hand quadrant. So this design, I think, works a little bit better. All right, so that's one in the bank. Let's make a duplicate. Now, um, many of you know that uh, I've complained about your center alignment on things. And center alignment can be good, especially in this example where it is used to create visual rhythm, okay? To create a specific narrative sequence with rhythm infused in that to create a particular tone or emotional response. Additionally, the baseline of the word human is very linear and clean as so too is the cap height, which is the uh, baseline at the top of any capital letter. Um, so there's this nice little rectangle that sits above and below these two elements. And it's really nice and clean and it makes sense. Again, our brain is even still trying to make sense of negative space, the invisible shapes between the elements. Okay. So this is a strong design, it works. We could even put this down here, can maybe even move this down just for the sake of expressiveness. I also like the fact that this the tip of the book is right on the word human, which creates a focal point. So that's one in the bank. Make another one. This time, uh, to my earlier point, I want to make these linear, all right, completely left aligned. And so does that make a difference? Yeah, it still works, um, but this may feel more comfortable, okay? I would encourage you to tell me which you prefer. But what if I move this right here? Now it has a little bit of a different feeling. Also, I like the fact that the book tip 
is centered on the word us, which creates a relationship between the mother, the child, and the book. But maybe this isn't totally working out the, the way that I want. So let's pull this up. And now we have a longer horizontal uh, execution on this layout. This could also work. Maybe we can tighten up the letting, which is the space between lines, or what Canva refers to as line spacing. Maybe I can make this a little bit larger to create a point of emphasis. You tell me, I'm interested in what you think. Um, I wanna show you uh, another example that I've worked on and it's this one here. And so like really dynamic, captivating visual, learning from the leading edge of innovation. And this is where some of that expression comes into play, but you'll notice everyone that I've got center align text. Okay, there's a time and a place. This text is right aligned, okay? There are times that um, you can use left, center, and right alignment, and it can still work, okay? In some cases, you have no alignment at all. Um, like this one here, it's not really left aligned, it's not really centered. It's not right aligned, um, but it does create a sense of, of hierarchy and positioning, et cetera. So I will make this file available to you folks for you to um, mess around with. If you have Canva, I would recommend just making a clone of it um, and experimenting with it there. And if you do not have a Canva account, I would encourage you to go to canva.com slash education. Um, they do have resources for students. You should be able to create um, an account and go from there. So thanks for uh, tuning in. I hope this is helpful. Let me know what you think. Shoot me an email. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts. Cool. Take care, everybody. Have a good week.